my name is John McConnell. I'm with the uh, uh, group with Edwards. I'm a strategic account manager within the sales division there. Um, so I've been in the industry uh, a little over 20 years, been with Edwards for the last 14, almost 15 years, and uh, specialize in the, in the mass notification and emergency communications markets. Um, as Kathy said, that today we're going to really focus on uh, college campuses. In all reality, though, uh, many of the, the details we're going to review today and, and the code requirements and so forth, they can be used on, on all kinds of, of campuses, even corporate campuses. But we will focus on, on the college entities. So with that, we're going to get into a presentation here. Well, as we go through the agenda, we're gonna we're gonna really set the stage on uh, why mass notification and, and emergency communication systems are, are really needed uh, in this uh, in this environment. We'll also review uh, code compliances and, and uh, listing requirements, so some of the things that that are being enforced, and then we're gonna look at modern technologies and how we can maximize our investments. We're gonna uh, also, in that piece, uh, sort of compare and contrast at, at times uh, older technologies and, and how newer ones have, have advanced. And then we're going to uh, sort of conclude with uh, some best practices as far as uh, setting requirements, looking at integration, and uh, the actual design practices there. And we'll recap with, uh, with questions and answers. Uh, there is a chat that, that's, that's open, so if you do have questions as we go through, Feel free to put those in the chat, and at the end of the presentation, uh, we'll go through those those questions. So, really setting the stage, uh, some of the main concerns is what we want to talk about here. And one of the the first things we have is is outdated investments. Uh, as we go through the presentation, we'll we'll sort of highlight that maybe some of the technologies or some of the things that uh, you've put in place on your campuses may have started back in the 90s. So we may have technologies that are 10, 20, or even 30 years old out there, and, and technology certainly has changed. In addition to the technology changing, policy and procedures have changed, right? Your emergency response plans have changed. Uh, threats on campus have changed. So how does that work with your, with your technologies? Uh, the other side of that is what I call the, the, the Charlie Brown teacher syndrome. Uh, older technologies were designed really for audibility and not intelligibility. And so that can lead to uh, misunderstandings or confusion on, on a campus if, uh, if those there can't understand what they need to be doing next. Another concern that really uh, has, has been brought to the forefront is, is what campus dynamics have, or how they've changed because of COVID. Uh, today, we see a lot of on-site and remote learning, or even a combination of both at the same time. Uh, what that does is it, it changes the schedules um, of when our staff and students are on site, when visitors are allowed, uh, some of our sporting events and, and campus tours, and how those things have changed recently. And so, again, it, it just adds an interesting dynamic of how we need to communicate to those who are coming on site. Now, you know, the threats themselves, they really haven't changed throughout the years. Um, but what they have done is they've become more frequent, unfortunately. We think about inclement weather, uh, areas of the country that you never saw flooding, well, we have flooding, right? The areas there that were uh, somewhat prone to uh, fires, well, now, now those fires are, are, are raging, right? And the same goes for, for hurricanes and tornadoes and, and the like. So inclement weather continues to be a threat and can continue to bring new threats to our existing campuses. You know, we have uh, the, the political side of, of, of the world. We have social unrest uh, that is now being brought into our campuses sometimes. And unfortunately, uh, mental illness, right? I mean, that's a, it's a pandemic really that's, that's plaguing the, the world is mental illness. And when that goes unchecked or un Un, uh, 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 unmedicated and so forth, we know that at times that can cause or lead to uh, an incident on campus. We also have uh, disgruntled employees and, and staff members or ex-students um, that, uh, that we may have to worry about. And then just, just relationship issues, right? Uh, boyfriend, girlfriends, ex-husbands, ex-wives that, 
uh, someone who's usually never on campus, but all of a sudden shows up. So we have all kinds of different threats uh, that can lead to, uh, uh, to the use of an emergency communication system. And then really, uh, you know, the news, right? Um, I think uh, it, there's all kinds of positive news, but unfortunately what, what is brought out in the breaking news and continues to be brought out time after time after time is always the negative side, right? So whenever there is a crisis on one of our campuses, um, uh, you know, how did we respond to that? Uh, it's gonna be publicized, right? Uh, and, and what kind of lawsuits will come after it? So there's, there's lots of things here that really sort of set the stage on why it's so important or why we even have this discussion around mass notification and emergency communications. The next stage really for us to look at is the codes and standards side of, uh, of this whole uh, mass notification solution uh, design aspect. If you, if you think about the commercial world, outside of the educational market, um, most of the time we get referenced back to uh, the Qadar Towers, we get referenced back to the uh, unified facilities criteria, the, the government documentation for military bases and, and government facilities, where mass notification was really introduced into uh, the, the space. But for educational facilities, as you will know, there's also, uh, back in 1990, the Clery Act. So uh, really, colleges and, and, and the educational uh, sector, you've been dealing with emergency communication uh, or, or that ability to send a timely warning to the school community for much longer than, than most of the general public has. Uh, and, and with that, there's requirements of, of risk analysis, right? Assessments over the last three years, uh, do every October. So I, I'm sure that most of you uh, that that are that are on here from a, a campus or university, you've just went through that as a as a practice, right? Doing those analysis. From a code aspect, uh, though, that really that that the Qadar Towers, the, the UFC, and and really a in a uh, a combination of working with the Air Force and NFPA, we saw in 2003 more code language take place. And uh, from that, we saw uh, NFPA change from the National Fire Alarm Code into the National Fire Alarm and Signaling Code. And we see that Chapter 24 on emergency communications was, was added and continued to grow since, since then. In addition to that, um, standardization uh, companies like, like Underwriters Laboratory, uh, companies that are really looking at how do manufacturers comply with standards, right? Those standards uh, in mass notification is the UL 2572 standard. Now, those that are, that are used to, to dealing with life safety or fire uh, alarm systems would recognize the UL 864 listing as one of those UL standards. So this is an addition to that. This is the UL 2572, specifically around mass notification. And the next slide or so, You'll see how that listing is going to take uh, take effect here shortly. In 2018, uh, really, we see this is the the, the uh, most recent IBC or, or Life Safety 101 documentation that's really calling out that education facilities, no matter the size, K through 12 or or campus university, uh, they're requiring a risk analysis for mass notification, and this is a significant component to the emergency uh, management system or your, or and your emergency response plan for your facilities. So this, uh, this risk analysis is needed. And then in chapter 24 of NFPA 72, it really helps us define some of those things that have to be done within our solution that we're, that we're gonna deploy or that we're gonna design. In addition to all those different codes and standards and, and federal acts, uh, NFPA has, has a, a nice list of additional documents, the 1600 series documents there uh, that are great supplemental information for us. And then FEMA has a nice document on uh, incident management as well. That could be a great resource for, for you and, and uh, your designers. As we dig into NFPA a little, a little more here though, in chapter, chapter uh, 24 of, of 72, 
we're, we're going to recall that code is the minimum requirement, right? That's what can be minimally enforced. So we can always do more than the code requires, but we can't do anything less than. And with chapter, uh, or with, uh, with uh, NFPA uh, 2018, uh, the, uh, that code being more and more widely adopted throughout the states as more and more jurisdictions bring the, the, the newer releases in, we're gonna see a lot of these points uh, be enforced now throughout your communities. So when we look at that intelligibility, uh, it is going to be one of those key factors that STI or, or CIS scale, that's the speech transmission index. That's essentially how clear is the message, right? You'll notice that in the code, it's a 0.5. And on the reference there to the right, you'll see a 0.5 is really between that poor to fair quality range. That's the Charlie Brown teacher syndrome range, right? And really that's based on, on what older technologies that are deployed today are really uh, matching or, or falling into. If we think about intelligibility uh, versus audibility. It used to be in, in the past that uh, audibility was our main concern. If we couldn't hear it, what we did is we turned it up louder. And when we did that, we caused reverberance within the devices, we called echoing within the, the facilities, and it, it, unfortunately, it just made the intelligibility even worse. Uh, the fortunate thing about, again, modern technologies moving into the, into the future product sets that are out there, most manufacturers that are truly going after that UL 2572 listing uh, that, are, that are looking at the mass certification standards uh, and life safety as their, as their goal, they're going to be in that excellent range between 0.75 and, and 1 on that scale. So there is technologies out there today that can truly be deployed that don't that you know that that way surpass what the minimum requirements uh, are. In a little bit, we're going to go through the mass notification layers, which uh, we'll, we'll show the different layers there. Again, we bring out 3.10 of Chapter 24 is calling out control listings to have the UL 2572. So if we're in the middle of designing a system today and code enforcement is, is upgrading to, to the newer codes, then all of a sudden that UL standard, well, now it's taking effect within our facilities. We're gonna have to bring a product in that meets that, that standard requirement. And then when we think about um, mass certification, we think about an incident happening on our campus. One of the most important people that's gonna show up is gonna be the incident commander. And one of the things uh, within NFPA is going to be that operational control, the ability for a single seat of command and control. In many cases, uh, I think that the industry is sort of referring to a single pane of glass, uh, the ability to take control of, of not only the acting fire alarm system or voice evacuation system, the giant voice, and essentially all of the disparate systems that affect each one of the buildings and how the campus flows. That's going to come from one seat one command and control location and then incident commander is going to have to have the ability to either grant or deny or take control of that solution when he gets on site when we move next we're going to talk about the layers more that are that are in section 3.8 the first layer uh, layer one is going to be your in-building mass notification system and really, if we reflect um, on uh, earlier code adoptions and, and uh, the standards, this is the fire alarm system that's in most of your buildings today. Um, it may be a combination of a integrated voice evacuation fire alarm system, uh, or it may be a bolt-on, something that you've added to your existing fire alarm system in order to provide that mass notification, that, that voice evacuation section. Layer three, uh, or layer two, excuse me, is the wide area, the outdoor mass notification. Many refer to that as the giant voice um, mass notification. And so that's, uh, that's layer two. Again, an intricate part of the complete uh, section here of, of the layers. And then we have layer three, the distributed recipient mass notification. Uh, this is your text messaging, your emails, your computer pop-ups, your, your mobile applications, et cetera. Um, 
it's interesting as we as we do surveys and, and talk to many uh, universities and, and, and campuses around the country, uh, when we ask the question, what are you using for your mass notification system? Um, a lot of times, layer three, that email text messaging, that's what the answer is. And when we think about these layers, including layer four, which is the public measures, the, the public radio and TV, not any one of these is more important than the other. They really all have to be joined together to create a complete system. So layer one, two, and three, that's really where the technologies we're gonna talk about today fit. And uh, again, not any one of those is more important than the other. They all play an intricate piece of communicating to the public. So we, we've talked a little bit about the code requirements and the standards and, and why we are, are actually even here today talking about the mass certification. So what do we do next? What, what are some of these technologies or what are some of the things that we need to focus on with changing technologies? When you think about layer one, typically, uh, as I mentioned, that's gonna be your, your fire alarm system. And uh, we're showing an example here of, a, of an EST4, but, but any fire alarm system really, when you look at the head end uh, of the solution, is gonna be a, a key driving factor of how the system will operate now and into the future. When we think about an incident happening, it's a highly uh, stressful event, right? And with that, we wanna make sure that it's as simple as possible for an operator to utilize. So having uh, pre-programmed switches, having the ability to have some touchscreen capacity, just making it as simple as possible is gonna be a key to choosing the right head end for your solution. One of the other things uh, is gonna be the automatic functionality, right? We talked about a lot of different threats, a lot of different emergencies that could take place. So, you know, having a thought process and planning for those, being able to integrate uh, the solutions to the head end in order to uh, automate as much as possible is going to be key. And another factor, too, is on the messaging side, uh, not only is live messaging important, but having those pre-programmed messages, and if you think about a campus, every building may require something specifically uh, different for, for that, uh, that building. Um, with that being said, does the capacity of your head end have that flexibility? Does it have the message capacity, the zoning capacity uh, in order to route messages and do that on the fly? And the, the last thing we'll bring out is that third-party integration. There's so many disparate systems out there that we may want to touch in the middle of an emergency, access control, building automation, et cetera. And so what kind of communication are we going to use? Is it going to be ECP, uh, XML, an API? Uh, what does that integration look like? That's a key thing to remember on the, on the front uh, part of your design and especially in, in your head end equipment. Now there's some, some other key points uh, as, as we go through that, that head end. And, and as you see on the top here, the head end does, isn't just for layer one. The head end is going to affect layer one, two, and three, and, and vice versa. So making sure that your head end is, is easily expandable. We know that the change is constant, not only with technology, but with your campuses. Uh, there may be a, a decision where uh, we were a community campus today, a community college, and now all of a sudden we've graduated and now we're a state college. Or maybe we're a university with, with a football team or basketball team that just got moved up into a different division, right? With those requirements or with those uh, graduations, if you will, there could come different uh, requirements on your campus. And if we have a, a system up front that can have that expandability, have that growth capability to it, uh, both with forwards and backwards compatibility, now we can we can always advance into those into those new changing environments. Uh, I mentioned earlier, you know, UL, right, the, the compliancy side of that. And so, again, looking at uh, your location, your community, uh, the AHJ, your fire marshal, et cetera, they may not be requiring 2000, you know, 2018 NFPA today, uh, but that could come uh, even from the time you're designing to the time of deployment, those changes can come. 
So looking, you know, future proofing your system, making sure that the all of the components, the, the control equipment, the IT backbone, the endpoints that you're you're looking to deploy, all of those can comply with that UL 2572 is something that uh, is is a, a key part of your return on investment uh, in the future here. Providing supervision, it's something that we can't we can't speak more about. Um, because supervision or, or system integrity, it saves lives. The, the worst side of the event that you want to be on is that you pushed a button, you, you tried to, to speak in the microphone, and the system didn't work, right? That's, that's the wrong place. None of us want to be on that side. So having a system that supervises uh, the, the backbone, the amplifiers, the, the disparate systems that we're integrating to, being able to know that those things are all functioning, they're operational well before the event takes place. Um, or if there is an outage that we know that and we can we can actually take uh, um, measures to to correct it. So making sure that the system supervision, super uh, supervisory capability, system integrity is, is a key component to your head end and to the complete backbone of your mass notification solution. Uh, there's a, a long list of other things there. The, the last point that I wanted to touch on today was really cybersecurity. Uh, today we have so many different threats, and and a lot of our appliances are going to be uh, maybe an IT endpoint on the solution, or we may be interfacing with uh, these different disparate systems. That solution that you're that you're depending on in an emergency should never be. Uh, the weak point in your cybersecurity for your for your IT department either. So uh, look at look at that. Think about firewalls and, and how those those head ends are designed. Now another factor to choosing the right head end is how the deployment of the backbone of that head end works. I've never been on a campus. Uh, that was built in a, in a complete straight line or a beautiful round circle. And unfortunately, because of, uh, of the older token ring style communication protocols uh, within the fire and life safety world, most systems out there were deployed or had to be uh, or have to be deployed in a class A or class B telepathy. And uh, this requires a lot of infrastructure in the ground, uh, especially if we have to do a class A where we're going from building to building to building all over the place in order to connect them back together, uh, a, lot of, a lot of dedicated fiber or control cabling is in the ground in your property today. Now, how do we maximize the investment when we look at maybe new systems that we want to deploy? Thanks to, uh, again, the IP world, IPv6 communications and, and wireless communications, there are new ways to deploy uh, these head end systems. Uh, star, uh, star telepathies, uh, tree, mesh, uh, it really advances uh, the capabilities. Uh, it really works with how your campuses are built, right? I mean, you, you may have projects year after year going on and how that underground cabling to each building and how the, the, the life safety backbone was wired used to be a major um, major pain point actually in, in how do we get signaling from from point a to point b and possibly back today uh, the new communication protocols really ease that and not only are they communicating a uh, data uh, on a single pair uh, usually it's data and your voice evacuation coming across a single pair so if you do have existing investment in the ground a lot of that is then freed up. So uh, if you want to add uh, additional uh, systems, uh, CCTV backbones, access control backbones, when you're upgrading your mass notification system, it may allow for uh, that investment to be reused. Now, when we talk about mass notification, uh, we also have the incident management cycle that's part of that. And, and with it, Again, choosing the right head end is going to be key to how the incident management cycle uh, runs. 
we think about being prepared for uh, all these different types of threats we've talked about. Uh, there's different responses that we're going to have to to take depending on what that incident is. And the best way to, to go through this is to be able to train your personnel on those different threats. So having the right head in will allow you to go through those incidences uh, and train the personnel, uh, have the automated responses and, and show them how this, this works, being prepared. So then we have our response, right? The, the threat is happening and uh, now we've got to take control. We've got to take command of, of, of what's happening within our facility. So the head end, again, it's got to function properly uh, when, when you need it to. So how, how are the automated functionalities, whether it be notification, uh, whether it be uh, elevator recalls and shunt trips, uh, uh, door locking uh, or door exiting uh, egress, there's lots of different communications that have to happen there. And so how is that response going to work with your head end, whether it's a, a hardware feature or a software feature? We have the recovery stage next within that incident management cycle. Um, and so again, looking at the head end, how does it keep record? How does it record the events that are happening? Does it trace out what that commander did? Step one, two, three, what the system operated like? Uh, is it keeping track of those things? Because after that recovery, after you're, you're getting back to normal, there's the last stage of the cycle, and that's the mitigation stage. That's where we may have to show the trail of what happened uh, to the authorities, uh, to the lawyers, and, and et cetera. So uh, that cycle continues, right? After one threat, we have to prepare for the next. Again, having a system that's flexible. You know, no matter if that threat was a, a building fire alarm, if it was a severe weather alert, uh, campus uh, you know, violence, et cetera, on the, on the site of the campus, what's that next next step for us? Did the communication systems work, right? Did, did the in-building work with the outdoor, were the right messages sent to the buildings versus outside? Did the messages uh, go through emails or desktops the, the correct way? And then lastly, you know, was the command and control there for that incident commander? Did all the integration systems work together in it? And, uh, and let's go back and start training again our personnel on the system. We're going to move now into um, some of the differences between older technologies and newer technologies. And uh, typically, uh, or specifically, we're going to talk about speakers right now. Uh, this would affect both layer one and two of your mass notification solution. Uh, most, most companies use what we call a re-entrance horn design. And with that, the, the um, design allows for a shorter horn package within the speaker. The, the issue that we have with that is, while it's really good for tones, for the, the old siren tones that we used to, to, to push out, it's not really good for voice. So we get some, some distortion because of that design. Again, that's where the Charlie Brown teacher, uh, the, the, the wah 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 sound comes from. Now, newer designs, such as in the, the Hyperspike products that are available today in the market, those are designed around linear or bent linear uh, design, and it really lowers the distortion level uh, drastically. Um, I really liked what Kurt Graber said about this product. He calls it, he says that it has what he calls uh, musicality to it. If you think about um, really a, a symphony, the, the clarity, if we think about studio quality sound and the vocals that come out of studio quality sound, those vocals is what we want to have coming out of those speakers we're deploying today. If that kind of quality is coming out of those speakers, when we make our announcements, when we make those pre-programmed messages across the entire campus, we'll know for a fact then that everyone is going to hear, understand, and then be a little more calmer in, in how they react. If they can't hear it, uh, that reaction could, could cause hysteria. 
Now, again, that, that goes to that, that STI scale, and it goes to that intelligibility factor versus the audibility factor. So uh, not only do we want to make sure they can hear it, um, but it's got to be clear. Now, one thing that is, is changing um, uh, with these appliances, and really the focus of this slide here, is to show that a lot of power can come out of a very small package. Technology, as we know, I mean, look at our phones and, and other electronics in our homes. Uh, the technologies are shrinking and getting smaller and smaller. And today, there isn't just one solution that fits every single application. So you've got to really look around and see, is it an outdoor high power speaker array? Is it an indoor medium power speaker array? What, what is it being used for? And, uh, and how, how, how far or how clear will this, this system be for us? Now, on that note, we talk about new technology versus old technology. And, and, and I, I love the photo here um, of our, our district manager for Edwards in, in uh, South Florida, Steve Johnson. He's, uh, he's standing there with his arms out wide and uh, you, you see the speaker behind him. Uh, obviously, this is an older technology uh, that's been around for, for some time. Again, uh, older technology, larger technology, newer technology a lot of times means smaller technology. But we don't want to just stop with, with that comparison. It's big, it's small. It's heavy, it's light. When you think about putting a speaker system on top of one of your campus buildings, if you're going to put 800 pounds, 900 pounds, 1,000 pounds of equipment on top of your facility, that means the structural engineering is going to have to be done. But on the, on the vice, vice versa, if we're looking at newer technologies uh, that weigh uh, 20 pounds, 40 pounds, maybe 100 pounds, that still cover the same amount of coverage, right? Uh, a 48-pound speaker today can cover up to a mile and a half circumference. Um, that's amazing. Uh, and, and when you have a, a device that's that small, that means that it can be deployed quicker uh, without the cranes and the lifts, without the engineering of, of the facility. It also means that it can be tested. It can be tested as a proof of concept. It can be put in the locations where we want it to be and tested uh, without having to go through a great deal of, of bringing a crane in even. Right, so this is a, a legitimate way to prove out design concepts is to utilize newer technology. One question that we get a lot is, what do we do with our, our old technology that we have invested in? Right, again, some of the, the systems that are out there may be uh, 10, 20, 30 years old. And uh, so that question comes to us a lot. And we've also seen manufacturers go out of business within within the mass notification uh, arena. So the, the question is, yes, we, we can do upgrades. Uh, they're available out there. Many manufacturers have different capacities. So uh, one, one manufacturer may have to make a slight modification. Uh, another manufacturer may have to make a different type of modification. But whether it's the speaker, whether it's the communication pathway, or if it's the electronics themselves, there are options for you to try to reinvest into what you currently have and make small modifications uh, at a time. Oh, one thing that uh, I always say is it, it's, it's a common phrase, right? A picture is worth a thousand words. And so right now what we wanna do is we wanna share with you a video of, of how, clear, how clear technologies really can be in today's world. Thank you for attending today's demonstration of acoustic hailing devices. You are now listening to patented hyperspike technology by Ultra Electronics. The same technology is used in the HS60, 
which is recognized by the Guinness Book of World Records as the world's most powerful electroacoustic speaker with the usable communication range of three kilometers and beyond. There has been an emergency recorded in the building. Leave the building immediately using marked stairways and exits. Do not use elevators. Pretty good. So you can see, uh, especially on the, the last piece of that video, the difference between older technologies that you may have deployed and what newer technologies out there can do. You notice on the last video as well, there were five, it pointed out there that there were five speakers within that, that area, that room. And yet uh, the clarity from just one speaker line array was able to do much more than what those five, uh, five did. So what's, what's our next steps then? Uh, well, here in the presentation, we wanna really focus on system requirements next and, and sort of best practices. When you look at system requirements, you, you definitely want the, the most return on investment that you possibly can have. And, and really what that requires uh, is upfront preparedness. Uh, the design services need to be upfront and the documentation has to be done. I can't stress it enough, and, and through our strategic accounts or, or corporate accounts that we, we work with, um, document, document, document. Because what that does is it means accountability. It means accountability for the manufacturers you're working with. It means accountability for the integrators you're working with. And it means accountability to your own staff, right? Making sure that it's being used properly even after it deployed. Another thing is to be specific right do do your research i mean there's there are so many options out there in the industry so choosing the right equipment for your campus is going to be key uh, what equipment do you want what functionalities do you want be prepared to justify your selection make sure that when you point out you know there, this, this specific feature is what our campus needs and wants those are the kind of justifications that you'll need in order to be specific, but you can, you can do that. Another piece is the system life. How long is this system expected to last? Uh, and, and that goes much further than just uh, the, the, the physical product. It goes to the support of the product. Uh, it goes to the manufacturer. How long has that manufacturer been in business or, uh, or are they looking to obsolete this product that we're, we're selecting or is the, the business that we're buying from solving. Uh, we look at the integrator, the OEM partner, or the manufacturer. Is, is massification and life safety part of their core offering? That's something that, that's a key component to, to look at. Another thing on your system requirements is, we've talked about it uh, at length here, is the integration. Also, uh, I think there's a, there's a key a key dividing factor there between integration and interface, right? How are these systems, these disparate systems, going to work together? What is the functionality that we want? When we think about having 
four or five different solutions out there. Uh, over here is our fire alarm system. Over here is our access control system. Here's our, our distribute recipient. How do all these things go together? If I have to go to each one of them separately in order to hit layer one, two, and three of our, of our pyramid of, of mass notification, then that's not gonna be timely. And really when we think about it, time saves lives. Manual operation, essentially, uh, we've gotta look at and say, no, that, that's not for us. We've gotta figure out how to do more automation and be more effective with our time. And uh, really, again, it goes together. How, how does existing systems, systems that you've already invested in, uh, how are you gonna leverage those? How are they gonna interact with new investments? With layer three, we see a lot of change, uh, even in collaboration tools like, uh, like WebEx and Zoom and, and Microsoft Teams. How do we integrate those today? What methods will the system use to communicate to these, uh, to these uh, systems that we're, we're integrating with? Is it gonna be a common alerting protocol? Is it gonna be through an API? Who's gonna write the API? Who's gonna pay to write the API? Or is it gonna be through um, a, an ECP XML uh, protocol? There's lots of different communication pathways for, for integrating and interfacing with, with other systems. So doing, again, that research up front, knowing those things in advance um, is going to be key to how you design and deploy your solution. And then something that uh, I think all of us um, can probably relate to is uh, most people he here, we, we've heard the phrase Zoom fatigue, right, so especially since the pandemic, right? We've been on, we've been on uh, these cameras on our computers way too much. But another thing that we, we probably could say is we also have licensing fee fatigue, right? Everybody uh, wants a piece. And that's something that uh, when you're looking at uh, these mass certification solutions, the upfront cost is one thing, but what's the reoccurring cost, right? And, and if we're interfacing and integrating systems properly, there should be a way for us to reduce some of these costs that are out there. Now, when we look at best practices, um, something that we, we unfortunately see is the piecemeal effect. Uh, you notice there on, on the left, the picture, we've got uh, three, four different types of speakers or, or notification appliances. Uh, you know, when we look at a brand new system, we uh, look at making additions to an existing system. How can we leverage uh, this existing infrastructure that we have in place. Again, we know a lot of technologies changed since the, the 1990s. So there may need to be a, a rip and replace uh, of some of some items. But uh, you know look at look at how we can really put the systems together. And when I say that demand a proof of concept, uh, if you're working with a with a manufacturer, if you're working with an installation uh, provider, Demand a proof of concept, really. Uh, have them show you, uh, go to uh, the manufacturer's design center, uh, go to existing sites, have them bring the demo to your site and show you how it works uh, at the location on top of the building that you wanna put the system uh, on. Just, uh, you know, those are, uh, again, because of the size of technologies and, and how things have changed, that should be something that, that you can demand from your partners. And then collaboration. You know, we think about collaborating with maybe an engineering firm, uh, collaborating with a manufacturer or an integrator, but we also have our in-house collaboration. We need to really focus on that internal team and also that first responder team, whether that's an in-house first responder team or maybe a community first responder team. Get that collaboration. Another piece in, in design, uh, best practices for your design is do the modeling. Uh, there's, there's software out there that allows you to really show and represent what your system should, uh, should look like when it's done. And don't stop there. But again, you're gonna hear from me, uh, if you ever talk to me about mass education in person, uh, 
proof of concept, do the demo, trust but verify. Uh, these uh, design software programs are not perfect. A sound is not a perfect science in how it's deployed throughout a campus. So while I can give you these beautiful pictures of color, um, showing up and doing demos, um, that is going to really prove out the solution before you even spend a dime on it. So demand that proof of concept, demand those demos uh, for your solution. Now, I think uh, most of us have probably heard the, the old phrase, KISS, keep it simple. Uh, in this case, we're gonna call it keep it super simple, right? So we look at our GUI interface, uh, we look at how the user, how, how you as a, as a user are gonna use this system and train on this system is gonna be key. We can understand that we could have a solution that is designed perfectly, installed perfectly, and that we are imperfect people, that we can be the single point of failure. So making sure that we have proper training of our staff is another best practice that we, we need to have. Uh, another thing is that service contract, right? Uh, making sure that we do have a service contract in place. Uh, you know, as a manufacturer, that's something that typically you're never going to hear from me because I don't do service. Those are your integrators that do that. It's really important, though, to have that service contract in place. That's what's going to make sure that the system's working. When those supervisory signals come in that we have a failure on, a, on an appliance, they're out there, they're fixing it, and it's corrected before the incident happens. So we're going to sort of bring the, the presentation to a close here. We're going to reflect on the possibilities. We want to plan for the future. We want to embrace the integration. We talked about how the fire alarm system a lot of times is going to be the central part, the layer one of your solution. We're going to have our in-building mass certification. We may also have specialty applications like uh, in your uh, auditoriums or your coliseums. And then on the other side, uh, how can we attach other disparate systems directly to that fire alarm system? Again, how do we reduce some of these uh, licensing fees. Sometimes that means taking some technologies and adding it to a core product you already have. We also have our wide area or our outdoor giant voice mass certification. That's going to be a piece of your solution. That software base, how does that integrate with the head end? And then how do we get out to those disparate systems? How do that true integration to the access control, the CCTV or, or the video management, your building automations. And then uh, the thing that's that's very important is how do we get out to the cloud, right? What other technologies are out there? Digital signage, uh, Microsoft Teams, uh, iPods. How, how do we get out there and connect to those disparate systems? And at the end of the day, that single seat of command and control, that incident commander's got to be in control. So focus on, again, reflect on the possibilities, plan for the future, embrace the integration. As we recap, we think about those layers one, two, and three. We can see that uh, there's lots of technologies out there. Some of them will affect all three layers. Some of them won't. And so not one single layer is more important than the other. There's lots of things here that, that we, could, we could point out. And I'm really just gonna look at, at just two items. There's no one size fits all. Every one of your campuses is completely different. It's not built in a circle. It's not built in a straight line. So really that design and infrastructure, that upfront um, proof of concept testing, so, so important in your design of your next or your remodeled mass certification system. And then cybersecurity. Don't let your most important tool here be uh, the piece that brings down uh, your your facility. So really focus on on cybersecurity hardening as well. I don't think uh, our industry talks enough about that today. Well, with that, um, I want to thank everybody for for attending our, our webinar. And at this time, we'll open it up for questions and answers.
Thanks, John. That was really great. Um, and we have about seven minutes left, so I just want to explain in the interest of everyone's time, um, we're going to go on. We have a very large group today and quite a few questions, so we may go over our allotment um, to end at noontime East Coast. What we'll do is we're going to continue to record. If you want to stay with us, we'd love to have you. If you need to disconnect and go about your business, we totally understand. The Q&A session will be recorded, so you won't miss anything. Um, <clears throat> and excuse me, one last housekeeping issue on the CEUs. Um, if you did not register, and you already let me know um, that you, you want CEUs, all you have to do is send me um, three learning points, something that you learned today, and that will verify that you attended. Um, if you registered and attended, really all you have to do is send me an email that says CEU in the subject line. That's all you really have to do. The email address is support team at campusfiresafety.org. Um, and that will do it. We'll send you CEUs. Um, which uh, are equivalent to one hour of learning. Um, okay, so I'm gonna go on now with the questions. You mentioned a demo of an outdoor speakers on the facility. In the past, companies brought a trailer. How do you do a demo? Uh, it's, that's a good one, Kathy. I mentioned earlier, we sort of showed that, that picture of, uh, of Steve Johnson. Uh, that was in front of the, the older speakers and, and you're right our uh, even even our older technology we had to bring out on a trailer and, and we were limited to, to where we could actually demonstrate the product mm -hmm. at. because of the size of the the systems today uh, those those systems really can be deployed and tested uh, at the at any point uh, on your facility so um, I know myself and, and many of the district managers within our firm, uh, we've been able to go out and assist our, our end clients. Uh, you know, when a speaker only weighs 48 pounds and it can cover, you know, a mile, two miles, uh, it's easy to, to put that on, the, on your back or on your shoulders and you can go up on the roof and, and test it out. So there are, again, these, these smaller technologies are out there that really, they pack so much um inside of them and uh, we we encourage you to to prove that concept out uh, we've seen many designs that once we've done the testing on they've had to be altered um sometimes uh, we have to add more many times we've had to add less uh and so you know prove prove it out uh, do the demos it's, it's so important i remember the the, the trailers um yeah. is is there a cost-effective way to connect different voice evacuation fire alarm manufacturers together on our campus? It, we uh, we do see um, it wouldn't be it wouldn't be a um, a unique thing to say that a lot of times campuses have been controlled by the budget and by the budget of a general contractor. And uh, so at times, yes, we, we've seen that where you know, your campuses have, have multiple manufacturers through it. So uh, many of us have gone through uh, different application processes and, and really proved out that there are communication pathways available. Uh, there's different technologies that we can, we can utilize. Uh, every campus is probably, or every, every manufacturer is gonna work a little different in how that happens, but many manufacturers uh, us at Edwards, we have the ability to, to do that, to go in and, and to bring many of those uh, uh, non-Edwards panels into a cohesive solution. Okay, thank you. Next one. I noticed the gun shoot detection system on the fire panel. All the applications I've seen in the past are cloud-based. How is yours different? No, that's that's an excellent one. I'm, I'm glad you uh, whoever that was. I'm glad I'm glad you saw that there. Um, we we see that shooter detection is something that is truly important in campuses. 
and controlling and, and really communicating properly. Um, but you're right, most of the solutions out there are somewhat of a cloud-based or a server a server software-based application and not really uh, sort of a hardware-only solution. There are a few, however, uh, we've, we've been working and investigating uh, quite a few different solutions. Uh, the one we showed was, was a product by Eagle um, that uh, is, is a contact closure. So uh, that allows us to, to actually uh, put it right onto our SLC loops and, uh, and give it a, an address. And then from those addressing points, control how we communicate uh, through our notification appliances. So there, there are possibilities. Again, um, you know, it's sort of a, um, a site by site or application by application, but we can definitely uh, talk with, with you on that further. Okay, thank you. And we've got about five or six more questions and anyone feel free to keep asking questions because we'll go on as long as it takes uh, in the recording. Um, on the third party integration piece, I notice Zoom and Microsoft Teams. How does that work? And can I use a mobile app to activate my MNEC? Um, so, so that's one thing we've seen recently. Again, all these different disparate systems out there, um, there's a lot of software-based solutions. And when it goes to the digital side, um, it, it really becomes endless of what we can do. And uh, it, going back to when we talked about what kind of what kind of protocol is the solution that you're using uh, going to utilize? Is it CAP, uh, that common alerting protocol, or, or is it uh, like an ECP XML? Um, or are we going to build an build an API for it? So uh, a lot of these. Uh, I mentioned earlier too the the um, licensing fees, right? It wouldn't be un uncommon uh, that your college campus is already paying for some sort of licensing fee for a collaboration tool like Zoom or like WebEx or like Microsoft Teams. So a lot of these digital platforms out there that we can integrate with um, through through such as uh, like the ECP protocols. Um, they allow for collaboration tools to be in that group. So rather than paying for a licensing fee for Zoom and then paying for a desktop alerting uh, license fee for all of those computers that you have on campus too, a lot of times it may just be adding the proper server to your site uh, and, and, and providing that integration between the control unit or, or your software uh, and those collaboration tools. And that goes the same with your with your applications. There's there's different uh, mobile apps out there, um, and so it just depends. Uh, again, it depends on the manufacturer. It depends on that that uh, uh, protocol and how they're connecting and how that integration works. But there's definitely uh, possibilities that we can discuss. Okay, thank you. And the next question is from someone I've known for probably 30 years. Um, please expand on UL requirements that apply to the IT backbone. UL routers and switches, cabling, sharing networks with non-life safety systems. Gotcha. So uh, there, there is a that's a loaded question. There's a lot. There's a lot in there. Um, and I would say that my application team would assist me even further on on explaining more of that. But with with UL 864. Uh, we've got requirements from the fire and life safety perspective. With the 2572 listing, uh, there's also um, the communicate or there's also requirements on that communication pathway. Um, here at Edwards, uh, our our EST4, EST3 platforms uh, have all gone through the UL 2572 listings uh, for those communication pathways. Uh, we also have, have partnered with companies like Cisco. Uh, to provide uh, IT backbone uh, um, switches and switch gear that all uh, have that um, UL 2572 listing. It comes down to uh, the protocol that's, that's being pushed through. It's going to come down to um, uh, the backup power and, and a lot more in there. So I'd uh, love to have that discussion offline even more if, if you wanted to go into more detail. All right. Thank you. 
Um, does Edwards offer a native solution for integration with DRMNS email notification? So we, we do have some native capacity um, out, of, out of some of our newer panels uh, for email and, and uh, email to text capability. Um, I'll say it, it is somewhat limited <laughs> native to the control panel. Um, but uh, the flexibility depends on how we, we operate with your IT team. Uh, also through our Firework solution, we've got some, some emailing and text meshing capability that could be utilized as that uh, DRM Um But then uh, again, we, we've got the ability to, to integrate with, with others out there, with other manufacturers that really uh, play in that world um, from, a, from a, uh, an integration standpoint. Okay, um, let me just. <clears throat> MNEC is applicable in the Middle East region. I think that's a. Someone's asking if that's an. Uh, if, is that a question? Is mass notification applicable in the Middle East? Gotcha. Um, if if we could, um, Kathy, have that have that question sent over uh, to the team. Uh, I don't <clears throat> I don't uh, participate in our in our international business, so I'm not really going to be able to speak to that. Uh, I, you know, I know that Edwards as a, as a whole, we have deployed uh, systems overseas with our international team. Um, as far as the requirements uh, and so forth, I wouldn't be able to, to speak to that today. But we could definitely. Um, have that team reach out to that individual. Okay, no, I understand. Um, and it looks like this might be the last one. Are scrolling message boards still used in modern systems? We, we do see uh, scrolling message boards. Um, one thing we see a lot more of, I think now, is, is uh, just the, the complete digital signage. The ability to take a take over uh, TV signage and so forth in the campuses, rather than the the the, uh, the LED scrolling signs. Um, there are some manufacturers still out there that that, that are in that business. Uh, at Edwards, we don't we don't do anything with the scrolling signs, but we we do look to integrate with with providers on um, uh, the more digital signage side and the, the digital pop up applications. All right. <clears throat> Um, it looks like any more questions we're going to, um, we've got a few more minutes. Uh, I just want to say it looks some, oh, there are some questions about the CEUs, but I, I can take care of that. Um, some people have came, come back and said, thank you, John. <clears throat> Great job. Other people are looking for uh, copies of your PowerPoint presentation and uh, we have your name. We'll let you know how to, how to get that. Um, we will have the recording online by the end of today, and um, that's it. Great job. Um, people are saying thank you to you, and and that looks like like we're done. Very good. Well, again, thank thank everyone for attending. I appreciate uh, you guys supporting the the WebEx and, uh, and Campus Fire Safety uh, Forum here, and uh, we look forward to to uh, speaking with you guys next time. Thanks, John. Thanks, everyone, and take care.